Hey, welcome to Family Church. We are a diverse, spirit-filled, life-giving church, healing hearts, building relationships, and developing leaders. My name is Pastor John Mark. I'm so excited that you've connected to our page today. Be sure to grab a notebook, a pen, a paper, your phone, however you want to take notes and get ready for today's message. Welcome back. We are in a series on the book of Romans. If you missed last week, go to the website, watch Pastor Josh. What, it was probably the best uh, sermon on Romans 6 and 7 that I have ever heard. Uh, the layout, the design of how he taught that, and the misconceptions of those passages and what the reality is uh, scripturally. It's a great, great, great sermon. So if you go to familychurchny.com, we have a brand new renovated website. It's very, very simple. It's broken down into buttons. That's all it is. And you can kind of just hit a button and go into what you're looking for. We're still working on other things. If you see something missing that you're looking for, let us know about it. We will try to add it to the website. But man, I laughed so hard last week in some of the stuff that Pastor Josh was doing. Um, It was really, really great. So go back, watch. If you're watching online and you're watching us from Facebook, might I suggest going to our website and going to our online platform. We are working on creating a full-blown online campus, an interactive campus. Uh, Believe it or not, we have quite a lot of people who are watching us out of state. They've either moved away or they have found us online. They like the way that our services are. And they're watching us from out of state. So if you're watching out of state, put something in the chat, what state you're watching from. One of our hosts would love to find out where you're at today. Our key text for this series in the book of Romans is probably one of my favorites. It's uh, in the King James and the New King James, kind of mistranslated. Uh, I like to study out of the New Living Translation, NLT, or the ESV, English Standard Version, A lot of times during service, I will use the NIV, the New International Version. There are some verses that I don't like in the NIV that I prefer in the NLT or the ESV. So anyway, you just got to know that when you're reading a Bible, you're reading the translator, what they believe those Greek and Hebrew and, and Latin words were to put them in certain order. So... It does not make the Bible null and void. It just got to understand who's translating it, what their slant is theologically. But Romans chapter 8 says this, There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. Let's take a moment and pray. Father, we thank you for this time that we could worship you today. We thank you for the, the depth of your spirit being here. Your word says that where two or three are gathered together in your name, there you are in the midst of them. So thank you for being our guest and rising up on the inside of us today. Holy Spirit, we ask you to open the eyes of our understanding, enlighten us to your truth. In Jesus' name, amen. Speaking about eyes, I went to the eye doctor the other day. And got my eyes checked. And obviously I knew I needed a new prescription for seeing distance. And the doctor asked me, how old are you now? I said, I'm 43. He said, well, do you need reading glasses? I said, no, I don't need any reading glasses. I, I can read just fine. And so she, you know, did something to the thing. You know, you have your face in it. She does all this. And she puts this thing in front of me. And she's like, can you read this? And I said, I can't read that. And she did something else. Bam. I could read all the way to the bottom line. She said, sir, you need reading glasses. So I am now wearing transition lenses, a.k.a. old school bifocals. So if you see me going like this and like this and like this and like this, I'm trying to figure this thing out, all right? So... (laughs) By talking about a doctrine from a guy named William Blackstone. Anybody theology major heard of William Blackstone? Probably not. All right. He was written in the the 1700s. In 1769, he wrote out a doctrine, and, and I want to pose it as a question today. Okay? Are you ready for this question? You're not gonna like it. Let's put it up on the screen. Is it better 
to put an innocent person in prison or to set 10 guilty people free. I'm going to let you think about that. Is it better to put an innocent person in prison or to set 10 guilty And there's rationalizations on both sides. There are people who say, you can never put an innocent person in prison at any cost. There's others that say, release 10 felons, you're going to destroy society. You want to know what the conclusion was? William Blackstone, not Mike McKelvey, William Blackstone, this is his doctrine. He says, it is always better to set the guilty free than to condemn the innocent. I know, I know. It's like this room is just divided, right? It's seriously like Democrat or Republican here. (laughs) According to Romans 8.1, God our Heavenly Father actually does both. He does both. He, He not only sets the guilty free, but he does it by condemning it to his son, Jesus Christ. Now, before you get all upset, before you get all judgy, if someone's guilty of a sin, they should pay for that. If someone's done wrong, they should pay for that, right? Because we all cry out for justice. We all want justice. When that person flies, oh, so (laughs) I, I think I already told you this story. Someone cut me off on the highway, so I flew by them. And I end up getting pulled over, got a ticket. And then he, drive by, he drives by as I'm pulled over. And he's like, waves at me. He's like, oh. Right? He wanted justice because I blew by him and, and whatever. We want that. Get them. They broke the law. They're wrong. And we always want justice when someone else is done wrong. But we don't really want it when we do wrong. Come on, have some grace. Come on, give me some mercy. Come on, officer, it was only 25 over the speed limit. Yeah. That was after he reduced it. Check this out. I want to read a quick story for you. It's on topic, but it's off of where we're going. 2 Samuel 12, verse 1. And the Lord sent Nathan to David. David was king. He was chosen by God. He came in and said to him, There are two men, King David, there's two men in a certain city, the one rich and the one is poor. The rich man had very many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing but one little lamb, which he had bought. And he brought it up and he grew it, and it was a pet to his family. Now there was these travelers that came to the rich man, but the rich man was unwilling to take one of his own flock or herd and kill it, and prepare it for the guests. But the poor man's lamb, so they took the poor man's lamb, killed it, and prepared it for the guests who had come. David is angry. It kindled against the man. And he said to Nathan, as "As the Lord lives, the man who has done this deserves to die. And he shall restore the lamb fourfold, because he had done this thing and because he had no pity. Nathan says to David, you are that man. You are that man. No, you didn't steal someone's lamb, but you stole some dude's wife. And you already got like 200 of those. You didn't need to do this. You took this man's wife, you took Bathsheba. You are that man. Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, anointed king over Israel. I delivered you from the hand, right? He's reminding him of who he is. Listen, Nathan's not coming to even condemn him. He's reminding him of who he is. Come on, somebody, who are you? Who are you? You are a child of the living God. You are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. A lot of times when we step into wrongdoing, it's because we forget who we are. We forget that we're free from the bondages of sin. How often do we do the same thing? Condemn the guilty. They need to pay for it. 
Can I tell you something today? You are the guilty one in the story. You and I are the guilty ones in the story of this book. Because of one man, sin entered the world and death by sin. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. This is not one of those sermons today where I'm trying to make everybody feel bad. That's not my point here today. I'm really going to get to the good news today. The bad news is we're all the same. We are all the same. In a, in a generation that's crying out for equality and I'm all about it, guess what? We're all equally dirtbags. We're all equally not deserving of God's grace and his riches. That's why the grace is called unearned favor, undeserved, unmerited favor. We are all the same. We are all guilty, but thank God there's Romans 8, right? We've looked at a bunch of bad news throughout Romans. Now we get to Romans 8. There is therefore, now say it with me, now. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ. There was condemnation. There was condemnation for those who were trying to follow the law. There was condemnation when you couldn't keep the perfect law and you messed up. You, yeah, you darn right you're being condemned. And, and the payment for that was death. Okay? There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus for the law of the Spirit not the law of the templates or the tablets, right? The law of the tablets condemns, it kills. You can't have a relationship with stone. But the law of the spirit of life, look, look what it's saying here. The law, the law of the tablets of stone is death. The law of the spirit is life. It sets you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. We have a little saying here. Anytime you read a verse and you see the word therefore, there is therefore, go back and find out what it's there for. Right? Simple saying. Anytime, it's just Bible study 101. Anytime you read a, a, a passage and it says therefore, Go back and find out what it's there for, okay? Because it's to tell us something's changed. There's a shift that's happening. All this is true, all this is true, all this is true. So therefore, because of that, here's this. Now watch. In order for us to understand that, we need to go back to Romans 7, verse 21. So I find it to be a law that when I want to do what is good... Evil lies close at hand. I mean, doggone. Come on, somebody. Let's just break this down to like simple everyday sins, okay? You're going on a diet. You're going on a diet, okay? So the diet and breaking a diet, not a sin. Come on, somebody. Chocolate cake ain't a sin unless you got diabetes. That's a sin. Breaking your word. Breaking your word is a divorce. Giving your word and breaking it, that's divorce. That's breaking of a covenant or a contract. So to say, I'm going to lose 10 pounds, I'm going on a diet, and then you go to work, and someone brings Dunkin' Donuts, and they put it at the staff counter where the coffee is. And you, you lie to yourself, you deceive yourself, you go in and you're pouring that cup of coffee, but you can't stop looking at sin. I'll just take a half a donut. So you reach in the drawer, you pull out the little plastic knife, you cut it in half. Okay, a quarter. And you eat that little quarter while you're sipping the coffee at the counter. You walk away. There's three quarters of that donut left. <laughs> if I don't have it, someone else is going to have it. So for the sake of saving someone else from not dieting, I'll, uh, I'll sacrifice my own diet. You go back and you eat this, the second quarter. 
And we do, we do this. We do this in many areas of our lives. This is how we sin, y'all. It's not like someone dives deep head into the biggest sin of their life. They played with it for a while. They tasted it for a little bit. They got away with it. I didn't put any pounds on with one donut. I guess one donut fits in my diet plan. Come on, somebody. Anytime I want to do what's good, evil is like right there. Watch 22. For I delight in the law of God in my inmost self, but I see in my member another law at war against my mind, making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. Then he goes, wretched person that I am who will rescue me from this body of death. There's only one who can. Because I'm telling you, over and over and over again, it might not be a donut, but it might be a lie. It might not be a lie, but it's a poor self-image. If it's not a poor self-image, then it's denying the power of God thereof. If it's not that, then it's not involving God in your life. It's not worshiping God in your daily life. It's not going to God before you make a decision. And listen, listen, listen. And I know it's so easy for us to get judgmental at someone whose sin looks different than ours. But anything short of God's perfection is sin. And none of us can live up to that standard. He says, who can rescue me from this wretched body of death because I can't do this? Every time I try to do better, something happens. Have you ever tried to save money? <laughs> We're saving money. We're getting out of debt. The dishwasher breaks. We're getting out of debt. Ma'am, you need tires on your car. Right? We set out to do something great and something good. And it's like, oh my God. It's like I keep getting buffeted and something comes up and something keeps knocking me down. The Apostle Paul here is laying out a massive problem for humanity in simple terms. He says, my innermost self wants to please God, wants to follow God, follow his commandments. But Paul also realizes that there's this thing in the human flesh that's not perfect that wants to do what's wrong. And he asks this question, who will rescue me from me? Who will rescue me from me? And, I, and I'm going to say this to you. I, I don't know that the devil attacks me as much as I attack me. I, I don't know how much the enemy is prowling around like a roaring lion coming after Mike McKelvey. I know Mike McKelvey begins down a road of success and gets overwhelmed and anxious and then self-destructs. Don't look at me like that, like I'm some kind of loser. I'm talking about a human, a human flaw, something that can happen to all of us. Let me give, let me give you another example. There's, there's some revivals going on in the United States right now. Asbury College is seeing a form of revival happening in their services right now, which is pretty amazing. It's pretty awesome. But do you know the death of every revival? Human nature. The death of every revival is publicity. The death of every human revival is monetization. Very soon there's going to be Asbury College Revival t-shirts for $29.99. And it'll end. Because we self-destruct. God does something great and we want to keep it going. We want to make, hey, remember Moses. Moses goes up on the mountain. He gets the law. His face is glowing. But then the, the glory begins to fade and he's embarrassed. I can't let the glory fade. I can't let people see that God is, you know, that that moment's over. So he puts a veil over his face to hide that it was fading. Human nature, pride, got to keep things going. We get in our own way. We sometimes and many times get in God's way. And Paul is saying, and it's something that we need rescuing from me. We need rescuing from ourselves. And who will rescue me from sin and death? Paul has this struggle. And he simply says, save me from my sin. Save me from my sin. What can I do? 
I can't do this on my own. There is therefore now. In light of what I just said, in light of all these things that I keep self-destructing and I keep getting in the way and that I can't overcome sin, there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life has set me free in Christ Jesus. I'm free from those things. Condemnation is the Greek word katakrima. If you really want to get into it, it's katakrima. It means punishment following condemnation. Punishment following condemnation. This word carries with it the context of being convicted or condemned after being found guilty of a crime. So what Paul is just saying here, he says, I am guilty of sin. I am guilty. I am guilty of the crime, yet in spite of my sin and violating what God has given to me, there is therefore now no condemnation. This is justification. Big word, justification. That's what this is. Justification. By the atoning sacrifice of Jesus Christ, by bringing sin into his body, making the atonement, he has justified us. We now operate in justification. Justification means, therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. You ever heard the old saying, don't do the crime if you don't want to do the time? None of us can avoid the crime. We can't. Humanity is in a fallen state. By virtue of sin entering the world, there is that original sin. Our, our flesh desires to do those things. Paul is saying here that we are all guilty of doing the crime, yet we are free from the punishment and condemnation. Not because we are able to do it, but because Jesus Christ did it for us on the cross. Hopefully I'm not going too deep. Pastor Mike, now are you saying that we can just go do whatever we want. Man, if that's what you heard, we got Q-tips in the lobby to first clean your ears, and then we got anointing oil to clean your soul. No. God forbid, Paul says, is, should I just keep on going on sinning because of what Jesus did for me? And Paul says, God forbid. Now listen, if I was writing the Bible, is it okay for me to say a cuss word? Yeah, I can say a cuss word on stage today? If someone, yeah, I'm going to say a cuss word. I'm just telling you right now. I just wanted your permission. I'm going to say it anyway. If someone said to me, should we just keep going on sinning because what Jesus Christ, hell no! No! That's not at all what I just said. Doggone it. You know, right? He's like, God forbid. He just didn't say hell. God forbid. That's not what I said at all. We're talking about the people who can never move forward in their life because they can't get over a bad decision they made in their life. They keep looking at that decision over. I'm not going to do that again. I'm not going to do that. 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 And they just keep circling around their sin over and over again. They can't get over it because they are more sin conscious than they are God conscious. They are more sin conscious than they are righteousness conscious. Again, it comes back. You're doing the bad things because you forget who you are. You forgot who you are. You are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. It just gets better though, man. Romans 8.3. 8, For God has done what the law weakened by the flesh could not do. By sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh. And here's the crazy part, man. When you go back and look at it. When, when, uh, I just wonder. If all this happened today and Mary went in to have a paternity test. And they tested that baby. Whose daddy would it show up as? Would there be a DNA strand that they could tell who the daddy was? Right? Because we can identify the father by the blood. 
We can identify the Father by the blood. And if, if the blood of Jesus Christ was celestial, if, if it was divine, that means it was not tainted by sin. He came in the form of sinful flesh, but he was without sin. He wasn't only without sin because he didn't do anything bad. He was without sin because it was never in his flesh until the cross. Until the cross. That's when he took on embodied sin, all the sin of mankind. It transformed him. It mutated him. He, he would, listen, not only was he beaten beyond recognition, but becoming the sin of the world distorted his human, human view. And he did that for you and me. Because we could not deal with sin in our flesh, Jesus did. He did what the law required by fulfilling it in us, for us. He took it on. No one could be saved by the law of Moses. The law of Moses laid out a standard that no one could live up to. But Jesus Christ could. He did and he gave his life for us. Imagine someone very close to you was caught stealing. And they had a moment where they had this urge to go into a store and steal something. And they were sentenced to life in prison. Life in prison for shoplifting. Unless they paid $100 right now. 100 bucks. Pay $100 right now, you don't have to spend a day in jail. But they didn't have 100 bucks on them. And they didn't have 100 bucks in their account. They didn't have Zelle, they didn't have Cash App, they didn't have Venmo. Only a hundred bucks. And they could be set free from life imprisonment. But they couldn't come up with the money. How devastating. And all of us are looking back, it's just a hundred bucks! I spend that on Starbucks in a month! You get a phone call from this friend. They say, hey, man, I'm guilty. I did the crime. I did shoplift. It was a Snickers bar. I was hungry. But I can't pay the 100 bucks. Is there any way, dude, is there any way you could send me 100 bucks to get me out of jail? What do you do? If I don't get it, it's life in prison. Well, first you're going to wonder if you're being scammed, because that's just the generation we live in. But I would dare say, if it was a friend of yours, and they were looking at life in prison unless you send them 100 bucks, you're going to do it on the spot. That's exactly what the Father did for us. That's exactly what he did by sending his son, Jesus Christ. You may be asking yourself, how does this apply to me today? Number one is this. You need to exonerate yourself from condemnation. You need to exonerate yourself from condemnation. You need to stop beating yourself up. Listen, I'm telling you right now, if you talk to me the way you talk to yourself, I'd probably punch you in the mouth. Huh? We beat ourselves up all the time. First, you need to work on your self-talk. You need to work on your self-talk. You need to love yourself. You need to speak good over yourself. Build yourself up. <laughs> Exonerate yourself. John 3, 17 says this, For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Exonerate yourself from condemnation. Number two, function by the unction. Function by the unction, the unction of the Holy Spirit. Galatians 5.16 says this, but I say, walk by the Spirit. And you ain't going to do that stupid nonsense. Mike McKelvey translation. Walk by the Spirit and you will not fulfill or gratify the lust of the flesh. Get into the Spirit in the morning and you ain't going to do that stupid stuff. Come on, somebody. Walk after the Spirit. Make it part of what you do. Get into the Spirit and don't walk after the flesh. It becomes so easy to 
fixate on not sinning, that we forget that it's easier to just start something than stop something. Get yourself distracted by doing what's right, and you won't have to do what's wrong. And number three, accept his atonement. Accept his sacrifice. Accept what he did. There is there for now no condemnation for who? For those who are in Christ. There is condemnation for those who are not in Christ. There is. And it ain't going to be pretty one day. But for those who are in Christ, that means his atoning sacrifice brought you into the family of God. You're free from the law of sin and death. But you're not free to just go do whatever you want. Mm. We have died to self to live unto God. That's part of this whole thing. Part of this whole thing is saying, I'm accepting what Jesus Christ did, therefore I am putting on Christianity. I'm putting on Christianity. I'm putting on that I'm going to follow Christ and what he sets out. That, that's part of this deal, guys. That's part of this deal. Well, I want heaven, but I don't want to actually be a Christian. I don't want to actually be a saint. I don't want to actually do what the Bible says I have to do. I just want heaven. I just don't want to go to hell. It don't work that way, man. This ain't a buffet. Right? You don't get to go pick and choose what you want. I don't want the broccoli. This ain't it. It's like I'm, I'm, ex I'm accepting Jesus Christ and I'm accepting what comes with that. What comes with that? Jesus needs to be at the center of what we're doing with our lives. Jesus needs to be at the center of all the things that we're doing in our life. I want to close today by inviting you into this condemnation-free life. Maybe you walk around with guilt. Maybe you walk around with shame. Maybe you beat yourself up all the time. The Bible tells us this, to cast our cares onto the Lord. Cast that guilt and shame onto the Lord. Cast the worry, fret, and anxiety on the Lord. He says, then take on his yoke. Take on his burden. For it is easy and it is light. I've been watching these videos of revival happening in the United States and it doesn't look like anything we've ever seen before. It's, it's not even a Pentecostal revival. There's no signs and wonders and miracles happening. Do you know what it is? It's people from all over the globe coming together to sit in the peace of God. In an anxiety-driven world, in a depressive world, in a self-hating world, in a confused world, people are experiencing the peace of God that transcends thought and mind. They're coming to this place where they're accepted in community. No, it doesn't matter what background. Just to feel the presence of God. And I said, well, doggone, we have revival every Sunday then. Because if you can't feel the peace of God that says, I love you just the way you are, I accept you just the way you are. While you were yet a sinner, I gave my son to die for you, to pay that price for you. But I love you so much that I don't want to leave you in that sin and in that guilt and in that shame and in that pain. I want to bring you from glory to glory, from grace to grace. I want to enhance your life and make it better. I want to give you the gift of the Holy Spirit so that when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, you can be a witness to those around you that the joy of the Lord would be your strength. And you do that by making Jesus Christ your Lord and Savior. Here at Family Church, we invite you to pray this prayer of salvation with us. And because we love you, we pray it together with this. Dear God, I come to you just like I am. I believe that Jesus Christ is my Lord and my Savior. Jesus, I invite you into my life to change me and to make me new. Thank you for accepting me in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.
Thanks for watching today's message. My name is Pastor John Mark, and if this message has made an impact in your life in any way, I'd like to ask you to do a couple of things. We want you to like and subscribe to our channel and join us right here every Sunday at 9.30 a.m. or 11.30 a.m. The next thing I'm gonna ask you to do is to take your next step in your journey. We'd love to help you do that, and you can head over to FamilyChurchNY.com or email us at team at FamilyChurchNY.com to get started today.